out. Let your glory and your grace be upon us. For in Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to say that it's good to be back amongst you once again. Thank you, Lord, for thank you for your support and for your prayers. And um, because you kept lifting your hands at home here, God has been faithful in also enabling the success of the endeavor that I want to do in the Philippines. I'll give you a fuller report in due course. So this morning I want to speak on the topic, the King of Glory. The King of Glory. My text is Psalm 24. So I'm going to read through Psalm 24, 1 to 10. It says, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. The world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He who has, a clean, who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor, sought, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. May the Lord bless his work, his, his word. Yeah, this morning, as I said, I'll be speaking on the title, The King of Glory. I want to answer that question. Who is the King of Glory? Who is the King of Glory? To start off, we need to ask ourselves, who is the King? If you're going to ask, who is the King of Glory? The best starting point, I believe, is to ask the question, who is a King? A King is a ruler of a dominion, of, of a domain, of a specific area. He has power and authority over a defined area which he directly controls. So he, he, he controls a kingdom, a king's dominion. And he influences other kingdoms. There's those places where he does not control directly. A king has authority and power. Authority is the power or the right to give others to make decisions and to enforce obedience. Power is the ability to make things happen. So within his domain, a king has the power or the ability to make things happen. So that is a king. For example, in Ecclesiastes 8, 8 verse, verse 4, the Bible says, Where the word of the king is, there is power. And who may say to him, What are you doing? In Proverbs 16, 14 to 15, it says, The wrath of a king is a messenger of death, but a wise man will pacify it. When a king's face brightens, there is life. His favor is like a rain cloud in spring. When it says that the wrath of a king is a messenger of death, you can cast your mind back to the story of Mordecai and, um, and, and, and Ammon. That when the king's face turned against Ammon, it ultimately resulted in his death. Why? Because the king is supreme. Whatever he says goes. If he's happy with you, then your life will be happy. If he's sad with you, your life will be sad. 
So a king has the ability to impact the lives of his subject. So that's the definition of who a king is. So the next question is, what is glory? How do we define glory? Because if you are talking about the king of glory, then we understand what the king does or who he is, then what is glory that qualifies that king? Glory is defined as praise, honor, or distinction extended by common consent. So when we're talking about glory, it is something that is recognized by everybody. It is not just subject to private interpretation. Glory is high renown or honor won by notable achievements. When you do something that is glorious, that is worthy, you is that will be honored, you'll be accepted because of that. Glory is also magnificence or great beauty. The glory of something, when it shines, is like the best when you is is like the best ex example expression of that person, that thing. That's his glory. Glory is also great admiration. It is honor. It is praise that you can earn by achieving something or something which deserves admiration or honor. So it is to exalt with triumph. To glory is to rejoice proudly. Now, now that we understand what glory is, so we are saying that when we are talking about the king of glory, it is a God who is that can do great things. A God who is worthy of honor and our praise. A God that we can exalt in triumph. That we can say, thank you, Lord, that we can worship because he is worthy, because of the things that he has accomplished in our lives. Now, it's not that we know who the king of, what it means to be the king of glory. Let's try and understand the expressions of that glory. There are two types of glory. As for God, there is God's tangible glory and there is God's intangible glory. The tangible glory is the glory that you see or you can see is physically manifested. And the intangible glory is the glory that you can't see but you can experience it. It is not often that God manifests his glory tangibly. More often than not, he goes behind the scenes. He works out his glory in our lives. And ultimately, people are able to see it because of what is accomplishing in our lives. Examples of the tangible glory of God is the Shekinah glory of God. When we are talking about the Shekinah glory of God, we are talking about the physical is like expression of the glory of God. This was what happened when God was leading the Israelites. And he appeared to them during the day by pillar of, of, of cloud and night by pillar of fire. Everybody could see it and it was a glorious thing. You know, they didn't have to worry about not having enough light at night. Or they didn't have to worry it's like that they would lose light right? because the glory of God was their permanent light. During the day, the cloud was there to shield them. So in just the same way that the glory of God shields us from all those things that could harm us. So those are the tangible expressions. The Shekinah glory is a tangible expression of the glory of God. Another example of the tangible expression of the glory of God was during the dedication of the temple by Solomon. We understand that the glory of God was so much heavy and present. Was so, the cloud descended to the point that even the ministers, those who have been commissioned to minister in praise, they were unable to do anything. They were just falling under the anointing of God. Why? Because God's presence was so much there. The glory of God was there. Another example of the glory of God was when Moses had an encounter with God. He had stayed in God's presence for so long that the glory of God started rubbing upon him. And what happened? By the time Moses came back, people could not look at his face. Why? Because his face was just so shiny. He had to be covering his face wherever he was going. Why? Because the glory was just radiating. So we understand that there is such a thing as God's tangible glory. And while it is uh, it is not always a common expression, we do know that it's something that exists. So talking about God's intangible glory, a very good example that I can give is when Daniel decided, ah, and his friends, they decided, ah, we're not going to eat of the king's wonderful meal. 
all we want to do is just eat porridges and then we will see and compare after 10 days and after 10 days they realized that they were even looking better than those who are eating good supposedly good good food that was the glory of god that was reflecting in their lives another example of god's intangible glory was obed edom's inexplicable blessing the, the glory of god descended upon the house for three months and things began happening and people started hearing that ah Something is happening in the house of Obedidum. That's the glory of God. When God starts a light into your life and he starts doing things that is like people have not experienced before or doing things that you yourself have not experienced before, it's like God starts manifesting his glory in your life. Things start working for your good. Things have been difficult before. Doors start opening for you. You're experiencing the glory of God. So glory of God is also our ability to prosper in every possible way. It can be in terms of promotion, it can be in terms of God is like opening doors for us or extending our, extending our borders or anything. So when we experience the glory of God, it means good things are happening to us. So now let's look at the characteristic of this king of glory. How would you know that you are experiencing the king of glory in your life? According to scriptures, the king of glory it triumphs gloriously. In Exodus 15 verse 1, it states, I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Note that word. He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider at the throne into the sea. So, to triumph gloriously, what does that mean? It is to achieve Victory that is resounding. Victory that it is a way that is worthy, a victory that is worthy of fame or admiration. It is to win impressively. So the king of glory, whatever he fights your battle for you, he wins impressively. To triumph is to win, to succeed, to be victorious in an epic or spectacular way. So when God fights for you as the king of glory, you are within your right to expect God to triumph in a spectacular way. When the Israelites, the Israelite women, when they sang this song, they sang it just after they had crossed the Red Sea and they saw what God had to do to make that feat possible. God had to open the Red Sea for them to be able to cross and then after that, he had to make sure that that Red Sea collapsed on the Egyptians' pursuer. So God wiped out the Israelites because he wiped out the Egyptians because he had told them, said, look at these Egyptians. Look at them very well because this is the last time you are seeing them. You will never see them again. So God triumphed gloriously. So when we are talking about a glorious God, that gives us an expectation that if he's going to be the king of glory in your life, you can expect that God will triumph gloriously in your life. So now, in order to be able to define what triumphing gloriously means, we can also understand it through what it is not. Now, there are different kinds of glory, or different kinds of victory. There is Pyrrhic victory. There is scrappy victory. There is good victory. And there is triumphal or an unassailable victory. A period victory is, is like, is, it describes a victory that is won, but at a great cost. A period victory is like victory that's, that predisposes you to defeat eventually. You may win the battle, but you lose the war. Why? Because your, the ex, the, 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 in, in trying to win the battle, the effort you put into it eventually breaks you. And you are not able to continue even after you've won the victory. So it is victory like a defeat. That is not triumphing gloriously. The reason why is that that is not triumphing gloriously because God does not give you a pyrrhic victory. He is the one that will fight your battle for you. And because he is the one fighting, you don't have to break your back. So God will give you total victory over your situation without it destroying you. Then there is crappy victory. You know when you just creep through. 
you just get 51% out of 100%. The problem with crappy victory is that if there is a remark, you can get 49%. So what seemed like a victory can quickly turn into a defeat. When you just scrape through something, you just that's just cracking through that's that's crappy. You, you it's like you just break even, and just because you break even, it also means that if things turn against you, you can break your back. So it is victory that is nothing to shout about. But you is, is victory all the same. That is why it is not triumphing gloriously. Then. There is good victory. You know, when you do an exam and you pass 70%, 60%, well, that's good. Even if they mark you down, you still get above 50. That's a good place to be. Good victory is good, but it is not triumphing gloriously. Why? Because it is good. Triumphing gloriously is God's best for you. And as they say, the enemy of the best is the good. So, because God wants you to have the best, because he is the king of glory, he always works to give you triumphant glory. When you triumph gloriously, when it is a kind of victory that there is no arguing about it, it is always hands down. God defeats your enemy totally that he cannot rise up again. That is triumphant glory. So, when we are talking about the King of Glory, one of his characteristics is that he gives you triumphant glory. He triumphs gloriously. So, God will cause you to triumph gloriously because you believe in him. Another characteristic of the King of Glory is the fact that God is glorious in holiness. God is glorious in holiness. God is a holy God. That's why I said, be holy, for I am holy. What does it mean to be holy? Be holy simply means to be pure, to be set apart. Now, we need to understand that there is a difference between human holiness and God's holiness. God's holiness is absolute. That means that there is no unholy thing in him. Human holiness, however, is relative. It is derived from God's holiness. The best way I can explain it is the sun and the light that it radiates. You know, the sun is a fiery ball of fire. On its own, it's just one continuous explosion that is going on, that is producing heat that is producing radiation, that is producing light. But if the sun were to stay just where it is and not radiate its glory to us, the earth will be dark. The universe will be dark. So God is like the sun. He is in heaven. But his glory radiates to us. So we can share in that glory. But that glory is out of his holiness. So what that tells us is that if we too want to radiate the glory of God, we have to also share in his holiness. It means that sin must not be what makes our life. The Bible says in Exodus 15 verse 11, it says, Who is like unto you, O Lord, amongst the gods? Who is like you? For you are glorious in holiness and fearful in praises, doing wonders. You know, the thing about this particular verse is that the moment God is glorious in your life, it also means that he's automatically fearful in your praises. It means that when it's like God is glorious because you are living a holy life and you are, it's like you are extending that radiant glory in, his, in, in your life, he's also fearful in praises because when the, glory, the power of God when it descends in his glory, the enemies, they run away. When God descended in his glorious holiness into the prison in which Paul and Silas were being held as they, praised, as they praised him, you know what happened? 
All the fetters and shackles they broke away. The, the doors they fell off their hinge. And the apostles were free to walk out if they chose to. So God, the King of glory, is glorious in holiness. The King of glory triumphs gloriously. The third characteristic of the King of glory is that he confers glory. You can't be the King of glory if you can't give glory. In John 17 verse 1, the Bible says that when Jesus had spoken these things, he raised his eyes to heaven in prayer and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that your Son may glorify you. Like his holiness, God's glory is absolute. It is innate, that is inherent within him. It is specific to him. God is, however, willing and able to share his glory with us. Specific, specifically because he's got it. You can't give what you don't have. So God can either make you glorious or he can deglorify you. That is, remove his glory from your life. Examples of those that God made glorious or that God removed their glorious. There are many, but we just need just about four, a few four. In 1 Samuel 2 verse 30, the Bible says, Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, Far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me, shall be likely esteemed. Who did God say this to? It was Eli. So who was God referring to? Aaron. God had promised Aaron, you will stand before me as priest forever. But when Eli's son started desecrating the office, God changed his mind. God removed his glory from their lives. Why? Because they did not honor him. So God can be glorified just as he can add glory. Second example of a video in 2 Samuel 6, 11 to 12, the Bible says, And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obedidom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obedidom and all his household. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obedidom and all that belongs to him, because, the ark of, because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obedidom to the city of David with gladness. Before the Ark of the Covenant entered into the household of Obedido, his life was ordinary. There was nothing to write him about him. But the moment the Ark of the Lord came and rested in that place, the blessing just started coming. Obedido did not do anything to warrant it. It just started coming. That is what God does to us. There are some times when God will just decide to favor us. And the blessing will just be coming without us even understanding or doing anything to warrant it. So God glorifies. Why? Because he is able to add glory to our lives. Why? Because he is the king of glory. Third example, Ichabod. In 1 Samuel 4 verse 21. This was a place where God removed his glory. The Bible says then, that is Phineas' wife, she said, she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God had been captured and because of her father in law and of her husband. On the day that God said, I have appointed this day as the day of your destruction. What the statement that captured it was Ichabod, the glory had departed. When God removes his glory, we will know. When God removes his glory from the life, of King Saul. Everybody knew. The king Saul that would lead the Israelites into battle and grant and help them to get victory became the king Saul who was always staying back, holding back. Why? Because the glory had departed. And that is something that we too should be careful of. What kind of life are you living now? Are you living a victorious life or a defeated life? Did you, is your glory in the past or your glory in the present, or your glory in the future. Because that tells you your state, or the state of your relationship with God. The fourth example of King Saul, 
in First Samuel 16, 14. It says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. God did not just remove his glory. He also has, he, he, he has proved that that glory has gone. He allowed a, 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 a distressing spirit to take over Saul's life. So God can add glory. God can subtract glory from our lives. Why? Because he is the king of glory. So the next question is this. How does God glorify you? What does he do when he wants to glorify you? The first point is that God glorifies you by never allowing you to be put to shame. The Bible says that they that put their trust in God, they shall not be put to shame. Yes. So what God does is that he invests his name in you so that your destiny and that of God's destiny, they become intertwined. God's lot becomes yours. Why? Because you have obeyed God. You have submitted yourself to God. So God will, of course, glorify you. There are just so many examples. When God, if God had not done anything, it would have been a shame. Imagine is it, uh, Elijah. When that widow's son died, don't you think it would be a shame? If Elijah was not able to raise that child from the dead, he said, and he called himself a man of God, and the child died while he was in the house. That's shame. You know, the simple truth is this. Many of the miracles that happened in the Bible, they happened because somebody needed to abide shame. The first miracle that Jesus Christ did in Cana of Galilee, it was to abide shame. So, turning of water into wine, was so that the relatives, the man doing the wedding, would not be put to shame. And because that person was a relative of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ would be put to shame too. You know, when Mary approached him, said, ah, look, what, what wine is running out. Can you do something? Well, do something anyway. And Jesus Christ said, me? What have I got to do with you, woman? I didn't come here to do miracle. I came here to enjoy myself. And Mary said, well, whether you want to enjoy yourself, that's the situation now. You have to do something. And Mary would not budge. So she went to the servant. Go to that man there. Whatever I tell you to do, you do it. Jesus Christ was forced to come out of this comfort zone. And what happened? He told them, put some water in the whatever, draw it, and then go and present it to the master of ceremony. And when they, when they, drew, when they drew it, it turned to wine as he was going. And when the man drank, they said, ah, what kind of people are you? You left the, the, is like the best wine for last. What's going on here? So, in order to avert shame, God did a miracle. God glorified himself. Maybe you are facing a shameful situation or a potentially shameful situation in your life. You just need to cry out to God, Lord, those that put their trust in you, they shall not be put to shame. Hope does not make a shame. Father, I hope in you. And as you trust and press into God, God will glorify him. His name in your life. Just ensure that you have obeyed God to the full extent. Because that was the rationale that Elijah he used before God on the Mount Carmel. He says, Father, let these people know that I have obeyed you and that I am your servant. Because God will not allow his servant to be put to shame. He will turn the world upside down. Hell will freeze over first before God's servants are put to shame. And that includes you. Another example, Joshua. In Joshua 3, 7, God promised Joshua, I will begin to magnify you so that nobody will be able to stand before you. When God magnifies you, God glorifies you before the people. When God does not allow your words to fall to the ground, of course, it's going to raise your extent. It's going to raise your, 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 the way that people see you before people. It will raise your reputation. That was how he confirmed Samuel. He did not allow his word to fall to the ground. Everything that man said, God fulfilled it. People start saying, ah, there is the word of the Lord in the, hand, in the mouth of this man. And they flock to him. So when God wants to glorify, he wants to glorify you, he will do something 
to you that will change your life. So, number two, how does God glorify you? By doing in us or enabling us to do what others cannot or what others struggle to do so that God can glorify his name through you. Example, David's killing of Goliath, first summer of 17. You know, everybody was running south because Goliath was north of them. They wanted to create as much space as possible. Why? Because they thought, ah, this guy is a problem. We can't resolve it. But Moses, I mean, David, instead of running south with them, he started running north towards the issues. Why? Because he expected that God would glorify him. Why have that audacity? Because he knew God's word concerning him. God had prepared him in an out of the way place when nobody was looking. He was able to fight and kill a bear. He was able to fight and kill a lion. And he knew that this same Philistine is, is just like an animal. The same God who had granted him the grace will not desert him this time around. So he knew God would have to do something new in his life. Or God will receive him into glory without him fulfilling his purpose. I know because God cannot lie. God will not allow anybody to put him to shame or to put him to, to, to his life to put, call him a liar. So God had to step forth and fight that battle for David. And he did something that nobody else could do at that point in time. And may I say something? When God glorifies you, you become a source of glory. You know, before Goliath, there was no record that any giant was killed in Israel. Everybody was running from giant clan. But after David, God raised a core of giant killers who, instead of running away from giants, they started looking for giants to kill. So what that tells you is this. When God adds glory to your life or glorifies you, you become an inspiration. You have your testimony that others will reference and say, if God can do it for David, ah, God will do it for me too. Why? Because the Bible says that it is God who works in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. When God glorifies you, it is God doing it, you're not you doing it. That is why you can't claim it. If you claim it, you are claiming death. In Genesis 26, God did the impossible. When Isaac was in Gerah, you know what happened? It was famine. It was famine that drove him there. Yet, the people were still managing to grow crops, but it was not prospering. And God said, go and sow in the land. For about two, three years, Isaac did not do it. Why? Because he was fearful of the people. But once God gave him the victory, he sowed in the land. And what happened? Isaac sowed and he had 30-fold, 50-fold, I mean 60-fold and 100-fold. Whereas the people of the land, the sons of the soil, they were sowing and they were not reaping anything. And right under their noses, Isaac was prospering. Why? Because God chose to glorify him. You need to understand that the secret of your success is not your effort. It is the glory of God upon you. That is why you need to give thanks to God at all times. It is God working in you. I'm sure you are working hard, but do you, do you know how many people work hard, but they have nothing to show for their hard work? It is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And then he gives you the means, he gives you the power, he gives you the grace, he gives you the ability, he gives you the science to do what is right in order for you to be all that God wants you to be. So when God wants to glorify you, he will set you apart and do what Others will struggle to achieve. He will do it effortlessly. Also, how does God glorify you? The third point is this. By removing every limitation to your maximized fruitfulness. You know, there is a leadership principle or law called the law of the lead. The law of the lead states that every one of us, we have our limitations. It's like we have the, the, we, we, there, there's only an extent to which you can't rise. We will rise to, but we will never rise above in our own power. 
We, we need an outside power, outside power that will help us lift the lead so that we can ascend higher than our natural, natural limitations. The Bible says in Psalms 3, verse 3, But you, O Lord, you are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. God is the one who lifts every lift, every lid of limitation. Whether you were born with it, whether it was placed upon you, whether it was afflicted with you, nothing doesn't matter. Whatever lead that has been stopping you from being all that God wants you to be, you need to understand that because God is the King of glory, He will remove that lead and enable you to ascend to heights that are unimaginable to you. You remember Jabesh? The Bible says that Jabesh was more honorable. You know that word honor means glory. He was more honorable. He was more glorious than his brothers. And he prayed and said, Father, bless me. Why? Because his mother had said had condemned him to a life of sorrow. God turned that glory, in that, in that inglorious life, into a glorious life. Why? By glorifying Jabesh. The Bible says in Exodus 33 verse 15, that in light of God, it is like when, when, when you have the, like, the glory of God upon your life, things will start happening. See, in light of God's presence, problems, difficulties, challenges, they are but mere excuses for God to reveal His glory in us. It doesn't matter what your situation is. When the God of glory alights upon your life, those situations that have been hobbling you, not allowing you to be all that you can be, they've just become opportunities for God, even to magnify his name. John E. Hunter said that a situation only becomes a problem when there is not enough resource with which to meet it. When God is with you, you may experience challenges, but you can never have any problem. Why? Because you already have the solution to that problem in God. Who is for you? Who is in you? You know, I remember a particular testimony that I read about years ago now. This group of people, they were traveling. And as they traveled, they, 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 their vehicle had issues, so it stopped working and they were by the side of the highway. This happened during their time. They were unable to resolve the issue. In fact, it took days for them to resolve the issue. But these people were Christians. They, were, they didn't know, so they had, they had nothing to fear. What they did not know, that the place where their, uh, their car broke down, was a den of robbers, just near a den of robbers. So, because they broke down in the day, the robbers knew where they were, and they planned to come and attack them in the night. So, once it was night, the robbers came. But when they got to the place where the car was in the day, all they could see was a wall of fire. They could not attack them. So they went back. Then the following night, they came again. It was the same thing because they hadn't resolved the issue with their car. By the third time, they came and there was still a wall of fire. They now came during the day and asked them, what is wrong with these, these people? Every time we want to rob you, we always see a fire. It is like a, fire, a, a wall of fire around you. They didn't know that there was a wall of fire protecting them. That is the glory of God. Another example, this one I read when I was a bit young. It was about the story of one farmer in Kenya. This one actually happened in Kenya. And you know, it, it, it's like there are, there, there are times, it happens a lot in Africa, where it's like you have low-cost infestations, where you, it's like you have low-cost swarms. They will alight on your field and they will eat everything. So it was already in the news that there was a low-cost infestation that was going towards that farmer's, uh, farmer's uh, old in his farm. So he went for the last time to go and look at it. He was, he was looking at it and he was, he was lamenting 
that uh, soon the locusts were going to come with his farm and they were going to eat everything. He went with his small son. And as, as they were talking, and he, 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 and he was talking, the, the son just challenged him. He said, Dad, do you pay your tithe? And he said, Yes, I pay my tithe. Well, the Bible says that because we pay our tithe, God will remove, rebuke the locusts for our sake. So let's believe God that God will do that. And they prayed and they believed God. And they went home. There was nothing else they could do. The next day when they came back to see what was left of their field, you know that the locust, they ate every crop, every green tree, up to the border of that man's farm. Then they ate all around it. And then they ate back, just the four corners, the perimeter of that farm. The man, not even one thing, one stand of corn was touched. Why? Because God showed his glory. When the king of glory operates in your life, he will do things that you can't expect. He will go beyond your expectations to fulfill his word concerning your life. The only proviso is that you make sure that you obey God. You do what is right and God will do what is right by you. Understand that God's glory is always, not even any, anybody's glory, is always a brighter reflection of a dollar background. You know, glory is not something that is abstract. The glory of the sun is there right, because there is a sun. To see something that will shine brighter, there has to be a dull background. Jabesh was a man of sorrow. His background was sorrow. God's glory was the fact that God honored him. So glory never exists by itself or in a vacuum. It is always relative to other things. For example, in Agai, chapter 2, verse 9, the Bible says that the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former. There has to be a former before there can be a latter. So glory is always in comparison. Robert Carlyle said that the block of granite that was a stomping block to the weak became a stepping stone to the strong. What God does is that God turns your weakness into your strength by glorifying you. So whatever God permits in your life for his glory is designed for your making and not for your breaking. You need to understand that. Whatever it is that is troubling you at this point in time, it is so that God can glorify his name in your life. In John 9, 1 to 3, he says that as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So glory is the ultimate expression of uncommon exploit. Daniel 11, 32 says that they that know their God, they shall be strong and they shall do exploit. Only those who know their God shall do exploit. Your life is glorious and reflects God's glory when it expresses the greatness of God. There is no glory in defeat. There is no glory in giving up. There is glory in you being a victor. There is no glory in playing the victim. You have to rise up and say, Lord God, glorify me so that my life can glorify you. So let's bring it home. You need to understand that you were made for his glory. Regardless of your life story up to now. You know, Jabesh had a story. He had before, he had after. Caleb had a story. He had before, he had after. Hannah had a story. He had before, he had after. You too, you have your before, you can have an after story. Whatever your circumstance, 
Your prayer should be, Father, glorify this child with the glory you have destined for me before the foundations of the world. Why? Because in Philippians 4, 6-7, the Bible says that we should be anxious for nothing. But in everything with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, we should make our request known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. The final question is, how do you attract the glory into your life? How do you make yourself, your life, attractive to the glory of God? The answer is in Psalms 24, verse 7 to 10. It says, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. You want to attract the Lord of hosts, the one who fights the battle for you, the one who fights has never won, lost the battle. The best way to do is to lift up your gate, to praise him. Psalm 50 verse 23 says, whoever, whosoever, offers, whosoever offers praise glorifies me. And to him who orders his conduct or his way are right, will I show the salvation of God. Praise is how you attract the glory of God into your life. You've complained long enough. Change your song. Start praising God instead, regardless of circumstances. The Bible says, give, give thanks to God in everything. Another fashion says, even for everything. So even when things are not working for you, you give thanks. Why? Because you know that it can cause all things to work together. It is causing all things to work together for your good. You praise him regardless of situation because the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. Mm. Sin makes your life ichabod. Praise restores your glory. Mm. So how do we know that praise works? Because it's a covenant. Numbers 10, 9 to 10. Just when you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with trumpets and you'll be remembered before the Lord your God. And you'll be saved from your enemies. Also, in the days of your gladness, in your appointed feasts, and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offering and over the sacrifices of your peace offering. And there shall be a memorial for you before the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. That is the covenant God has with us. You want to experience the glory of God? Praise Him. Yeah. Sammy said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. When God's praise does not depart from your lips, His glory shall not depart from your life. Mm. Whatever your circumstances, God can turn it around because it will cause His glory to alight. Mm. Just make a study of reading through the Bible and you will see mm. that when people sang praises to God, Praise is, is, proving, is a proven, guaranteed way of attracting God's glory into your life. So, why don't you start, start praising God today? Start exalting God. Start magnifying God. Start glorifying God. And as you do that, God's glory will alight into your life. And when His glory comes, your problems will be resolved. That which seems impossible becomes a reality. That which seems intangible becomes something you can touch as God glorifies his name in your life. Let's just exalt him. Let's magnify him. He is the king of glory. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the God who is strong and mighty. The Lord strong in might. The Lord who is strong in battle. He is the God of glory. The king of glory. Let's just exalt him. Oh, in Jesus' mighty name, we are afraid. Amen. Psalm 24 asks, mm. Who is this king of glory? Let's personalize it. Is this king of glory your God? 
who is your king of glory? Because where the glory of God alight, defeatism is defeated. Where the glory of God alight, victimhood is broken. Where the glory of God alight, you go from glory unto glory unto glory. So if your life does not reflect the glory of God, you can ask God, Lord, come into my life. Glorify me, O Lord God. I am your servant. Glorify me so that my life can glorify you. Lord God, I have been hearing of how you have blessed people. I have heard of what you have done to other people. Now do the same thing with me, O Lord God, so that others will hear about me and glorify you in Jesus' mighty name. Oh, kama shangara maru mori sundugo, hama kote sandish kishi, reke kama ro kote sandish kishi, e makor kata sandish kishi. Oh, so to that question, who is the king of glory? Your answer is, he is my God. He is my God. He is God who is strong in battle. He is the Lord of hosts. He is the one who fights my battle for me. He is the one who will glorify me. Who is the one who will magnify his name in my life. He is the one who will not desert me. He is the almighty God. The heir should die. The king of glory. The king of kings. The Lord of lords. The I am that I am. Father, Lord, I bless you. I honor you. I glorify you. I magnify you, Lord God. Oh, because you are glorifying me right now. You are magnifying your name in me. You will not allow me to remain the same. Oh, Lord God, you fulfill your purpose concerning me. I Give you all the glory and honor. Oh, my Kashakara Mato Sonu Goshi. Ready Kaba Don Sonu Shishkini Sakaba. Oh, my Karamato Sonu Shishkini Sakaba. E Kamarumuru Sonu Shishki. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Father, Lord God, we just want to bless you because we acknowledge, oh Lord God, you are the King of glory. We set out trying to know you, to define you. Now we know you. We know that you will not let us, oh Lord God, you put to shame. You know, we know, O oh Lord God, that you will set us apart, O oh Lord God, and do what, O oh Lord God, you will not do in others in us. Amen. We know, O oh Lord God, that you will do great and mighty things in us, O oh Lord God, as you prove and you, you yourself in our lives. Lord, for this we give you all the glory. Therefore, Lord God, like the psalmist, which will say, I will bless the Lord at all times. Your praise shall always be on our lips. Lord, I will praise you. Yes. Oh Lord God, in anticipation of your glory in my life. For Christ in us is the hope of glory. Hallelujah. And Lord God, then I will praise you, oh Father Lord God, for the enlightening of your glory in my life. As you cause all things to work together for my good. As you cause my darkness to turn into light. Oh Lord God, as you cause my shame, oh Lord God, to become testimonies. I give you glory, I give you honor, I give you praise. For in Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. Amen. Let us share the grace in fellowship. And may, may the, the grace, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ the, the love of God, of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Surely, His goodness and His mercy shall follow us. And all, all the days of our life, we shall dwell in the house of the Lord, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Amen. The Lord keep you. Amen. The Lord make his face to shine upon you as he makes you glorious. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that we should make his praise glorious. As you go this week, his praise shall be glorious upon your lips in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. He shall go ahead of you and he shall be your rear guard. Amen. Amen. For in Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for coming. Have a glorious and a wonderful week. Amen. Amen. <sighs> Bye. Bye, everyone.